Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well and welcome to, depending on wherever you may live or however you choose to read your clock this early morning, middle of the night bonus. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost a cent. Click the like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon. And folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to this middle of the night or early morning bonus upload, shall we? Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well and welcome to, depending on wherever you may live or however you may read your clock, this early morning or middle of the night bonus upload. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost a cent. Click the like button. It takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to this early morning, middle of the night bonus upload, shall we? Today's first New York subscriber submission. Hey Jeff, my name is MG. I grew up in central New York. We lived on a country road north of Lake Delta and Rome, New York. It was summertime. The area consists of large rolling hills, thick green forests, dairy farmer fields, numerous streams in the area cut valleys into countryside as they wind their way to the lake and Mohawk River. Where we lived, there was a small cluster of homes, a dairy farm, sat just down the way. My home's backyard was bounded by barbed wire fence. Beyond that was a sprawling field. The farmer used to grow fodder for his dairy cows. The crops changed from corn to alfalfa. This year it was corn. Far on the other side of it, the field was bordered by a stream that ran into the hills and formed a gully that grew deeper and further into the hills you went. On the side of the hill was a large grazing area the farmer used for his cows. Beyond this was solid woodland for miles, interrupted only by the occasional country road or farm. I feel I must give a detailed layout of my yard as that's where first what I believe now is a dog man. We had a large yard, the front had a slight raise. A line of tall pine trees bordered the front, with a patch of birch trees on the left front border. There was a large maple tree on the right side of the yard that was easy to climb in. 
This was set between the front row of pine trees and the house. The right of the house was two more large pines. The front most had an old tire swing. The backyard was also many pines. We had a German shepherd who lived outside in the backyard during the warmer months. She was on a chain attached to her doghouse. At the time I was 14, my life was normal for the most part. The original Nintendo was all the rage, but I loved being outdoors by myself or with my friends. I'd set off on long bike rides or hikes into the surrounding woods and valleys. I partook in archery and target shooting. In the winter, we rode our snowmobiles. This was still a time when kids had a lot of freedom. Since I was eight or nine, my parents had let me go off exploring on my own. Sometimes I even walked into the large field and woods behind our house at night, enjoying the stars and the moonlight. That would be the last summer I'd be going into the woods or our field by myself at any time of the day. A few weeks before the encounter, a kind of malaise fell over the area and me. It's hard to explain. Summer break should have been happy time of year. But something felt off, like an anxious, dark feeling. It was felt in the woods and fields where it was too quiet and subdued. Something felt wrong or off. Mike, my best friend growing up, felt this as well. We spent a lot of time at each other's places growing up, and he was around for everything that we saw. The night was strange. My parents were out of town. My older sister was working and didn't get home until 2 in the morning. Like I said, it was summer break. Mike was over. We had planned to have a bonfire, but a weird and oppressive feeling had caused us to decide to watch TV and play video games instead. Later that night, my dog was going nuts in the backyard. Now, normally, if an animal were about, her barking would scare whatever it was off. This time, though, she was not stopping. I first yelled out the window, and she kept barking. So I went out and checked the backyard with a flashlight and the house's floodlight. Nothing. I spent some time calming her, and she quieted down, but still seemed on edge. I myself also felt uneasy. Shortly after going back inside, Mike said that he had felt like we were being watched. He said he heard something moving in the front yard while I was outside. We had no AC, so the windows were open at night. We turned the lights off in the living room to see outside. The living room had a large bay window that looked out into the front. We had two lights out in front. Both were yellow to avoid drawing insects, so there was little light to see by. We sat in darkened silence for a time. A lone car drove by and we saw something move in the birch patch to the left. I shined a beam from the flashlight out, but we couldn't see anything. As soon as I shut off the beam, something large bounded very quickly down the line of pine trees in the very front of our yard. We could hear its movement. It clearly cleared the width of my large front yard within seconds. I thought it was someone playing a joke on us, or just a guy, because whatever it was had been clearly running upright. That much we definitely could tell. We were both scared at this point, and I was debating on calling my parents. When we saw it, it had climbed to a low branch in the maple tree and was peering directly at us. There was no eye shine. The eyes were black and did not catch the yellow light. It had pointed ears. Then it pulled back to where we could not see it anymore. With no eye shine, we thought still maybe someone like my jerk brother-in-law was playing tricks and that maybe it was some sort of mask. We grabbed the flashlight. We each had armed ourselves with a knife and decided just to step on the front porch and shine the light in the tree. We slowly opened the door and went outside. We were ready to get back in quickly. If we had to, I shined the light and the thing dropped down from the tree cut towards the right side of the house moving fast. 
It was six to seven feet tall, dark gray with black fur, inverted knees like a wolf's rear leg, long arms, black eyes. Ears were six to eight inches, but now flatter to its head. We were too stunned to run or do anything but watch. It happened so fast, it dashed to the side of the house. It hit the tire swing, sending it creening about. My dog was barking furiously. We were dumb enough to move to the side of the house. We had heard it bound away. It must have jumped the barbed wire fence because we heard it crashing through the cornfield, heading away. I got my dad's gun, a Walter PPK. He had shown me how to use it in case of an emergency. I thought this qualified. We went, I got my dog, and brought her in for the night. We told people, but nobody believed us. There were footprints in the yard and the driveway, which was a sandy gravel. They were large. My dad dismissed them as a large dog or maybe a coyote. In the tree, we found what we thought were claw marks. We for sure found very coarse, blackish gray hair. My dad again said it was nothing, either a raccoon or even a frayed old rope. We could see the path it had taken through the cornfield due to it busting and mangling the stalks. Several other strange things happened that summer. We now brought our bows and knives with us when we went to the surrounding woods and fields. We only went out during the day and we were looking for signs of the thing we had seen. About a week later, walking by the stream I mentioned earlier, we caught a strong smell of decay. We came upon two dairy cattle that, for lack of better terms, were torn to shreds. The smell was awful. Chunks of flesh had been torn from them. One of the ribs had been busted in, like something just tore it out. The other's head had been twisted off and laid several feet from the body. There were still organs and plenty of flesh. My mother actually walked out with us to see them. We went to the dairy farm down the road to tell the farmer. He acted unconcerned. He said he had butchered them for meat, but these animals were not butchered. They still had intestines, organs, skin. The meat missing was gorged out. We wondered if he was covering something. My mom was satisfied by his explanation. Soon after, in another location, this time in a, the grazing hillside the farmer let his cows out onto, we came across grass soaked in blood. We found long, thin, bloody strips of flesh with cow hair attached to them. The next morning, when we woke up, there was a single long strip tied around the barbed wire fence in the backyard. We thought at the time that the thing was playing with us. Early that fall, we decided to head up into the forest beyond the grazing hillside. We were maybe 70 yards to the tree line when suddenly there was a noise from the wood line. A deer broke through the woods and was running straight for us. It only veered away at the last second and ran off into a gully created by the stream. Oh, it scared us so bad. We were, we were like, WTF, why did it do that? Then we heard a serious loud roar and bellow. I had never heard anything like it in the forest. We turned back, keeping a careful watch as we retreated down the hillside. The winters in the area hit hard. The following year, that strange feeling was gone, but... Going out into the woods and field was never the same. On the now rare occasion we went out, it was always in the daytime and never alone. Even going to high school and becoming a young man, I'd have friends over and we'd have bonfires and a few unaged, underage beers. I always kept my eyes to the field in the woods, always. Also, we both had the feeling this thing watched us many times. We felt like it was playing games with us. Today's second Dogman New York subscriber submission. Now, I had mentioned when I narrated this the first time, probably about a year ago, that strangely enough, my mom had hiked this while pregnant with me. And I just kind of realized that 
this person was where my mom was one year previous to her going hiking while pregnant with me. Insane. I It didn't dawn on me. It dawned on me that it was the same mountain range or same mountain, but it didn't dawn on me that there was only a year separating it. It was July of 1975. I was 16, living in a small town just west of Rochester, New York. I had seen a flyer promoting from a Catholic youth organization in Rochester promoting a five-day hiking trip in the High Peaks region of the Adirondacks. My parents had agreed to let me go. There were about ten hikers and three counselors. The first four days slash nights were fun but relatively uneventful. Hours on the trail, rarely meeting anyone else on the trail. Living on freed dries food, jerky, pemmican, and fruit leather. Sleeping in trailside lean-tos or setting up our tents around fires. The last day was spent on the ascent of Mount Marcy. We spent the last night at the base of the mountain. Our tents were set up in a semicircle around the fire. We sat around the fire, singing the obligatory songs, telling jokes, laughing, sharing ghost stories. We were all in good spirits. One by one, everyone retired to their tents. My tent mate went as well, leaving me alone by the fire. As usual, I was the last one left by the fire. I've always loved night, especially when in the woods. So many people do not realize how alive the woods are at night. The animals scurrying through the leaf litter on the forest floor, the occasional call of the night bird, roosting birds changing positions. On this night, there was all of that, and off in the distance, there was one of my favorite nature sounds, the haunting call of the loon. I sat there looking into the fire for quite some time, feeling happy that I had a wonderful time, but also slightly sad that it was going to end tomorrow. Presently, I noticed how quiet it had become. All the sounds of nature had ceased, even the cry of the loon in the distant pond. The only sound was the crackling of the fire. I looked to my right and scanned the semicircle of tents. As I was doing this, I sensed movement out of the corner of my eye on my left-hand side. Turning my head, I saw about 20 feet away, peering out from between the trunks of two huge trees, what appeared to be the profile of a very large wolf's head, about six feet off of the ground, a pointed muzzle, large upright ears. Its right eye reflected the firelight. For a brief moment, I was too startled and amazed to be afraid. It's incredible how quickly the human mind can work and how many things you can try to process at one time. I remember thinking, too big for a coyote, there are no wolves left in the area. If there are, they don't climb trees and they aren't six feet tall. As I stated, the moment of amazement was very brief. It was replaced by fear so intense that I had felt it in the pit of my stomach. The type of fear that feels almost electric and that makes certain parts of the male anatomy shrink and want to crawl back up inside of you. Yet even with this fear, my mind was still going a million miles an hour, trying to let it sink in. I could see its right shoulder, what would be the deltoid muscle on a human looked huge. As did its bicep, its elbow was hidden by the trunk of the tree. I could see its forearm, it was held out horizontally. It looked somewhat slender and its hand, not paw, but hand, with long fingers ending in claws hung down at a 90 degree angle. As odd as this was, what was even odder still was, there was what seemed to be a primitive, very roughly made woven basket hanging from its wrist. It turned its head in my direction and tilted its head and looked at me from under its brow directly into my eyes. There was no bluish reflection as you get from a coyote when their eyes are illuminated at night, nor did they glow red as my huskies used to do. 
They were shiny, black, like obsidian, reflecting the light of the fire. As our eyes met, I was hit with an immediate sense that I did not want me, it did not want me watching it, and also a deep feeling that it was disdainful of me and humans in general, and that if it wanted to do, it could take me and I'd disappear into the night forever. I knew I had to get out of its sight and as quickly as possible. Since the first day of the trip, it had been drilled into our heads that the last person to leave the fire had to douse it. For that purpose, we had two buckets that we'd fill every evening, one with water and one with dirt. As I was the last one to go to bed, the buckets were next to me. All I wanted to do was dive inside of my tent. I did not want to scream or yell. I sincerely doubt I would have been able to, or douse the fire. I just wanted to get where I couldn't see it, and it couldn't see me. Yet, the rational part of my brain told me that I didn't want to be responsible for burning down a large chunk of the Adirondack Park. I grabbed the bucket of water with my right hand and I launched backwards from my cross leg sitting position, threw the entire bucket into the fire. The hissing sound and the plume of steam are still very clear to me this day. The tent was no more than 10 feet directly behind me as I scrambled inside. I yanked the zipper down and I got as deep into my sleeping bag as I could get and assumed the fetal position. That's all I remember until morning. I was in my sleeping bag, head, shoulders, arms outside of it. I heard birds singing their morning song and the tent was slightly illuminated by a gray dawn. As I went to sit up, I realized that the tent flap was unzipped and the lower half of my body was out of the tent. As I arose, I heard muted voices coming from a few tents, but no one else had come out yet. I walked a bit away to find a tree to pee behind, and when I returned, one of the counselors had gotten up to prepare breakfast and asked me if I had slept well. I hesitated and told them that I had. My tent mate came out and asked, I asked him if he had heard anything during the night. He said no. By that afternoon, we were on the bus and on our way home. I never told any of the group what happened. I never told anyone for decades. I've pondered this event for years, I'm analyzing it. I was thinking werewolf, but the only concept I had was the Hollywood version or the medieval accounts of werewolves, such as Peter Stubb. The accounts of them had them assuming the forms of wolves, not something half man, half wolf. The Hollywood versions of werewolves back then were basically just hairy guys with fangs until movies like The Howling came out with creatures similar to what I had seen, but only similar. It could not and still cannot wrap my head around people physically transforming into wolves. As the years have passed, while I still thought about it occasionally, I was busy working my butt off and distracted by life in general, until I heard about Linda Godfrey and the Beast of Bray Road. Bingo! But I still never told anyone about my encounter. Years ago, while watching TV with my wife, I came across a show called Monster Quest, the episode about the American werewolf. I was riveted, so much so that my wife tapped me on the shoulder and said, for a third time, do you want some ice cream? My response was in turn to her to say, that's what I saw. I then told her of my encounter. I'm pretty sure she believes it was just my imagination back then, but she patted my shoulder and said something about it. I believe I saw it, then I believed I saw it. I've read dozens if not hundreds of encounters online and in books since then. I found your channel a while back when I googled Dogman Encounters at Arondex. I'll email you again with an account of a two-dimensional silhouette creature that seemed dog-like, yet also hyena-like. This was in Newburgh, New York in the mid-80s. Thank you. P. And here is that email. 
I can't remember the exact year that this encounter happened. It was early fall, either 87 or 88. I had been an Army MP. My last duty station was the Stewart Army subpost at Stewart Airport in Newburgh, New York. After I got out of the Army in 84, I decided to stay in the Hudson Valley instead of returning home to western New York. I got a job working for a company that did unarmed and armed security, private investigations, and executive protection. This particular job was a surveillance of a sewage treatment plant and a small lake that was the town of Newburgh's water supply. Evidently, there was a bone of contention between the company that wanted to build some houses and local residents concerned that the new homes were too close to the lake and that their septic systems may pollute the water. There was a concern that someone may try to introduce raw sewage into the water supply I was told that outside of me, the only other people who knew of the surveillance was my boss and the chief of police. My boss met me on the site at dusk and showed me where to set up. There was a dirt road that runs around the treatment plant between the lake and the plant. The vehicle they gave me to use was a Ford Escort. Where I parked gave me a decent view of the plant. The trees were thick enough to do a good job of concealing the car yet I was able to have a decent view of the plant. Directly in front of me, the trees were so thick and old that they made an arch over the old dirt road, creating a tunnel of darkness. The front bumper of the car was up to where the tunnel of the shadow started. I sat there for hours in the chilly autumn air, windows down, motor off. The person I saw was a worker from the plant who came out to smoke a cigarette. About an hour after, I started eventually, I got to the point where I needed to stretch my legs. I made sure the dome light would not come on and I got out. I left the door open slightly to avoid making a sound. After stretching a bit, I decided to walk a ways down the dirt road. The trees made it pitch black with little ambient light from the plant was completely blocked by the trees. I cautiously walked for about 20 feet into the darkness when I heard directly in front of me a deep, loud growl. At first I thought someone may be deciding to take their dog for a walk, but then the noxious smell hit me. The smell of musk, decay, and filth. At the same time, the feeling of dread came over me, and the growl came again, but closer. I was carrying a 357 Magnum at the time. I drew it and held it at the ready as I began walking backward. It was only 20 feet back to the car, but it seemed a mile. As soon as I got to the car, I slid into it and shut the door as quickly as I could, and as quietly. No sooner did I do this, something came trotting up of the shadows. It was four-legged and huge. If it had approached the car, its head would have been equal to the roof. The head was massive. It had the same general shape as a Burmese mountain dog. It had rough of fur from its shoulders to the back of its head. The rest of it was odd-looking. While the body might have been about five feet long, it still looked too small for a massive head. The back sloped down considerably. Its hind legs were ridiculously short in comparison to the front. The tail was long, slender, and held out horizontally. It was completely black, unnaturally so. It did not seem to have any depth to it. I had a feeling that if it had turned its body, it would have disappeared. No features, no panting, no sounds of its feet as it trotted by. Five feet from my open window, mind you. It looked neither left nor right as it passed. Needless to say, I stayed in that vehicle for the rest of the night. My boss called me the ex next afternoon to see how everything went. I told him the only thing I had seen was a stray dog. Nothing happened the next night, the last night that I worked this particular gig. On a personal level, I'll think about being on the show with you. I'm actually a quite a shy person for a fairly large, large tattooed Viking type of guy. 
Today's third subscriber New York submission is technically, <laughs> it's technically happened in both states, the state of New York and Vermont, because Lake Champlain is shared by both states. And because he was very close to the New York State Bridge, I classify it as a New York encounter. Plus, Lake Champlain is 38, 40 minutes from my house. Literally, it goes my house to Lake George to Lake Champlain. Those are the three largest landmarks in my area. Literally, my house, Lake George and Lake Champlain. Get the joke, I'm just kidding. Anyway. Hey Jeff, this encounter happened when I was on Lake Champlain. I would go to Lake Champlain and stay on the lake in the cabins with my friends every year when I was younger. We really enjoyed it. This was back in the mid-90s. Myself and my friend Tom went to our normal place, the Sportsman Cabins in Virgines, Vermont, as we always did. I can remember the place being packed with fishermen as there was a bass tournament that week. Shortly after we arrived, my friend had to leave for a family emergency, so I was going to be alone for a few days at the cabin. There was a group of fishermen, the next cabin over, that were in the bass tournament. I kind of didn't want to hang around. I don't know why. That night I was alone. I decided to go down to my favorite fishing area. It was a tube that went into the back water from the road. It was a very popular fishing area on the lake. When I drove by before parking, I noticed that no one was there this night. Usually it was packed with fishermen. I was like, okay, I guess I'll get the best spot tonight. I parked my truck about a hundred yards down the road where the area was. I walked down and set up a fishing poles and it was a beautiful night. A nice breeze off the lake and the lights from the bridge to New York reflected off the water. I was really enjoying this. Behind where I was fishing was a black water area where a tube from lake went into and behind was farmland. I was just enjoying the night. Nothing was biting, but it was such a nice night on the lake. I noticed that off in the distance I heard a howling sound. It was pretty far away, so I wasn't really worried. Not sure what it was, maybe coyotes or something. Well, it's usually koi dogs up here and possibly a, a wolf hybrid that was bred up here and released up here, so. Hmm. The lake had such a nice breeze. I could remember the lights from the distant shimmering off the water. I noticed the howling noise kept getting closer. I knew that behind me was backwater, so it would be impossible for anything to cross that. But the noise was still alarming. I kept hearing this howling sound getting closer and sounding more like it was from something much larger than a coyote. I spent a lot of time in the woods and I've heard koi dogs and coyotes, so I'm very familiar with them. I was at the point, I was on edge as the depth of the sound seemed to be coming from a larger animal, maybe even more threatening than what I was used to seeing. You can imagine being all alone and hearing a howling sound steadily getting closer, and definitely was getting closer. At this point, I'm looking behind me where the noise is coming from. There are no cars coming down the road, which made this even more scarier. The howling was getting so close that it not only sounded menacing, but possibly life-threatening. I could remember it seemed to be surrounding me, and I thought, nope, that's not possible. At this point, I was suddenly feeling like I have to leave or face what's coming. I reeled in the lines and ran as fast as I could to my truck, slammed everything in the back, and jumped in. This felt like a death run when you believe something is just behind you and is gonna catch you. It's scary. I started up the truck and drove back to the cabins. As I was about to pull in, I noticed a fisherman next to the cabin, all out on the table, staring at me. As I was about to turn, I kept going and took the bridge to New York, over to Port Henry. Beautiful place. 
I parked at the first place that had a pull-off. It, ironically, was a champ billboard of all the sightings in the lake. I stayed there for an hour and a half before I felt safe to return. I believe something was out there. Sometimes it's what you do not see that's the scariest. I'm not sure what it was, but it was large, and you wouldn't want to see what it was. Love your channel. Thanks, I listen every night. RC. Thanks, RC. Well, there you have it, folks. Tonight's middle of the night or early morning bonus. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps the channel growing and going. And honestly, what gives people a chance and a place to share their experiences and theories judgment-free? Just simply treat it with the respect that we all deserve. Thank you. Everyone stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless. Well, there you have it, folks, this early morning, middle of the night bonus. I do hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. And I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. After all, it is your support that keeps the channel growing and going and what gives us all a place and a chance to share our experiences and theories judgment-free. Just simply treated with the respect we all deserve. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant. Keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends, these creatures are real. They are out there and they are dangerous. These events have happened. They are out there. This stuff is real. These are not creepypastas. Please share this information with those you love and care about. and It may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.